Hi everyone, my name is Erin Putney. I'm a master's student here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, I'm also a teacher of practical nursing at a local community uh, school. So I wanted to get my um, research data out there because I'd had a lot of people request this information. And while this isn't my favorite way to get information out there, it's the quickest. And so I wanted to share um, what I found. Um, a little bit of background about me. I have eight years ICU experience, uh, four of which were at, in Omaha at a level one trauma center, and then four of which, um, the other four are here in Lincoln at a level two trauma center um, ICU. So end of life is frequently happening in ICUs, and so um, it has given me a lot of passion about the topic. The purpose of my research was to see how soon nurses were having their first end of life experience and do nurses who complete six hours or more of end of life education in their nursing program differ in their score of the patient and family centered communication section of the end of life professional caregiver survey, um, which was done by Lansy et al, um, compared to the nurses who complete five hours or less of education in their nursing program. So um, this survey is a survey that was created by Lans Lazenby. Um, I apologize if I'm murdering that name, um, but uh, to look at the comfort. And I took the first 12 questions of that survey, um, which really focused more on communication and put that into my survey to see what our total scores would be. So when you look at the literature that's out there, um, I really broke it down into, into concepts. So I have the nurse's experience. And for any person or nurse that you ask how their first end of life experience was, they can usually tell you a pretty vivid memory of it, whether it be positive, negative, or indifferent. Most people's first end of life um, experiences are very, very vivid. When we talk to student nurses about their experience, themes that come out from um, Heiss and Gilpin, Gilpin play, talked about the unprepared and the emotional distress that um, our students have. And there's another article that calls them silent witnesses because just because we, they get that end of life experience in nursing school doesn't mean it's a good one because they may not have had an instructor that was prepared to um, debrief them and to communicate and talk to them about it. Other things that we talk about are the barriers to end of life education. Um, some uh, doctors don't want to talk about it, obviously. Um, but the other thing is, is that time is precious in the classroom. Uh, being an educator, I'm very well aware of how many hours or minutes we give to each concept or content, depending on your, um, your curriculum base. And so whether you want to give up time for mental health to talk about it, or you want to give up time from labor and delivery concepts to talk about it, I mean, it's just really a struggle to pull those minutes out so that you can talk about death. Because guess what? Death is uncomfortable to talk about. No one really talks about death um, anymore. They used to, our culture used to, but now currently in our culture, we really don't talk about it. The other thing that's interesting is that end of life education is not mandated necessarily. NCLEX doesn't necessarily uh, look at it precisely. It'll look at some didactics and some um, pathophysiologies or like interventions and stuff, but not really specifically like look at end of life. And if it's not mandated, nurses and educators aren't going to give it the time that it needs in their programs. The other thing I looked at for my literature review was um, the different types of end of life education modalities. And you have the clinical hands on experiences where um, I can't say this name, Quick Boom, Vale, and Eland, they um, took nursing students and partnered them up with palliative care patients. And then they compared them to the nursing students that they didn't, but had had the same um, lecture material. Uh, they, there's workshop experiences. So Bailey and Houston did a critical moments workshop. And then simulation, and this one gets kind of interesting. Uh, Lip and Becker did a withdrawal of care simulation and uh, really looked at some of those experiences. Another simulation that I really like to use actually is the rapid cycle deliberate practice by Hunt et al. 
This is where um, they do pediatric um, codes and the point of the rapid cycle deliberate practice is that if you practice the wrong thing but debrief about it later, you're going to do the wrong thing because that's the only thing you ever actually practiced. Well, they look at um, something concrete like a code situation where at 10 seconds, if you don't start chest compressions, you stop it, you debrief, do a quick debrief, restart and go again. Well, I started using rapid cycle deliberate practice for soft skills, like having an end of life conversation. If you don't address this concern after the patient has said it one or two times, then we need to stop, reset and go back. The other thing that's nice about it is the students also have the right to stop the simulation. If it gets too uncomfortable or they're struggling and they need help, they have the right to stop the simulation and say, I don't know what to do. And you can come in and help them instead of them watching them struggle for their 20, 30 minute simulation and then talking about it later. They get to actually ask for help in the simulation, making it a safe place to have those end of life conversations and to practice working with a patient who's saying, I don't want to do this anymore. The conceptual framework for my research and for um, the education that I give is a mix of experiential and emotional intelligence, which I think are both incredibly important for nurses, especially nurses learning to do emotional pieces of education. Um, this isn't putting in an NG where we have to know the skill or um, putting in a Foley where we just really need to know that skill and be able to focus on that skill where experiential becomes really important. You got to repeat and practice and practice and practice. When we're doing end of life conversations, we also have to be aware of that emotional intelligence piece that our energy controls the energy of the room. If we walk in and we're like either disrespectful or we are um, not wanting to go the same direction as the family, it's going to cause a lot of strife. So what I created was a blend of these two together, which is around each of Kolb's experiential pieces like act, reflect, observe, conceptualize, and apply, I also put the emotional intelligence pieces of self-awareness, self-reflection, empathy, and social skills, because controlling that environment is so important. I remember many times walking into an ICU room where families were shocked, and I needed to use both emotional intelligence and experience to get the patients and the families to the direction that they needed to be to be successful, either in bringing them back or in letting them go peacefully and beautifully. Um, so I call this the beauty of human humanity learning theory because death doesn't have to be ugly and, uh, and painful and horrible. While it is usually sad, ends are usually sad. Um, it's more the pain and the suffering that I really wanted to focus on getting away from. And we have to teach our students how to be self-aware, how to reflect and be empathetic in social skills, along with getting them some experiences in those very challenging situations. So my methodology is kind of wonky. So I had a uh, SCC uh, practical nursing graduate students, which I called the intervention group, because these are the this is the group that I knew had over six hours of end of life education. Um, and then I looked at also the, the general population nurses as kind of my control group and seeing what's out there. I compared the intervention group with the general population, and then I blended both groups together and looked at what students or new nurses reported as having for education. And if they had more than six hours of end of life or if they had five hours or less education. I ended up sending a survey um, out to uh, nurses and these graduates. So all of these graduates had been out for at least three to six months um, and working. So um, they were all nurses, which I think is really important because I didn't look at um, comparing like pre-workshop and post-workshop. I looked at what are students or new nurses using out in the real world from the education they got while they were students. Things that I asked in that survey is I asked demographics, asking about length of nursing and then their end of life experience. We did the Lazenby 
um, questions, the 12 questions focusing on communication. And then I also, just for, you know, kicks and giggles here, I added some qualitative in there because I just didn't think I had enough to do with my research. I wanted the memory of their end of life education. So looking at what kind of things that they remembered from end of life education, and then at looking also at the memory of their first end of life experience and what education they used in that experience. So I ended up actually asking three qualitative questions um, to kind of look at what they what they got for education, what their first end of life experience was, and then the um, what skills they used from school in that experience. So this is my intervention group, is the students that I teach. So in it's a four quarter program. In quarter three, uh, we do a workshop called Day of the Dead, which I usually shorten as DOD. Um, and the objectives of that are to identify barriers, so talking about why we don't talk about it, um, building skills of different, difficult conversations, which we do with some case studies and through um, some discussion. We recognize our own personal feelings and beliefs, so building up that emotional intelligence, that self-awareness. We demonstrate respect and support because that's a huge piece of helping our co-classmates and soon-to-be co-workers through uh, this challenging topic. And then we do some just basic education on palliative versus hospice, medications, what end of life looks like, grief, all that kind of stuff, and what kind of maybe support things we have in our localized area. Once we're done with that, in quarter four, we then do a simulation of rapid cycle deliberate practice where the students come in, they believe they're going to take care of a renal failure patient, and while they're in with that renal failure patient, the patient says, I'm done, and says, I don't want any more, okay? And so then they have to have experience with having that end-of-life conversation. They have to practice advocating for that patient so that the doctor isn't wanting to do procedures on them. Uh, work with family because we have a daughter come in and the daughter does not want uh, us to stop cares and it's all done in a safe place and remember we're doing that rapid cycle deliberate practice so if they don't meet one of these stop marks in that simulation we stop it talk about it and then either go back a few minutes or to completely restart it so that they get to practice having that good conversation and have, being a good advocate and not practicing the, oh, um, uh, what am I going to do? I don't know what to say or the total avoidance or any of the other things that many of them have done over the time. And we've gotten really good positive feedback from students after we've done this type of simulation because remember, they can also stop the simulation and say, I'm not, I, I can't do this, I, I don't know what to say, I, you know, instead of making them struggle through it, we come in and help them and guide them. Okay, so we've gotten to the results section, which is what everybody really wanted to get to. And sorry, I took so long laying the groundwork. Um, so I sent out 88 surveys to my graduates through email, um, that they had given the school as their graduation email. And I got 35 returned, which was about 40%. So not a too bad of a return rate. I did have a couple later after I closed the survey, ask if they could participate and they had just forgotten and stuff. But I, then I was already analyzing data and that was gonna be exhausting. General population, however, was just kind of a crazy one. Um, I put it on the Facebook site, show me your stethoscope. And within 24 hours, I had 300 surveys, which was amazing and overwhelming and so exciting. I shut it down once I got to 378 because I just knew in one semester I wasn't going to have enough time to get through that many. What I ended up doing is I wanted to look at new grad versus new grad. So what I ended up doing was I looked at the length of my students. So my students, the longest one had been out for 36 months. And then I looked at the surveys that I got from the Facebook site and I got it down to 48 months um, and or less. So these are all pretty much new grads versus new grads. Um, and so uh, that way they compared, I didn't compare someone who had been out there for 33 years, which I got some of those, which is amazing. And I will use all this data eventually, but for this project, I wanted to look at just those kind of newer nurses and how they were working with end of life experiences. I ended up with um, 35 
from mine, and then I ended up with 35 um, that were less than 48 months. When we look at death as a nurse, um, or first death as a nurse, it looks like from my research, only 7% of my nurses surveyed had not experienced an end of life or a death, a patient death in their career yet. 14% had done it in school. But remember, we talked about if their clinical instructor wasn't good or didn't debrief them, that doesn't mean that they had a good end of life, first death experience. Then we start getting into that first month, which 29% of our nurses had their first death within their first month. Now they're on orientation. So hopefully that nurse uh, that they're with does a really good job of letting them experience a good end of life uh, and positive and gives them some strong cues and tips and stuff like that. But that's again, not guaranteed. When we get to our second and third month, we get to 13% four to six months, we get to 16% of them. Um, and then this 11% is seven months to 12 months. So within the first year of nursing, you've got 69% of nurses are having their first death experience, which is huge. And then 10% are having it in their second year as a nurse. And then these 7% still are, hadn't had it. But that's also looking at, again, new grads, so you're looking at up to 48 months out. Also, think about places where you don't necessarily have a death experience. I think I had one nurse that said she worked informatics, one nurse, you know, that said she was just lucky. So, I mean, there's a lot of times when we don't get death experiences, not all areas of nursing do. If you're a school nurse, you're not probably going to get a death experience. Hopefully you don't. But... There's a lot of areas in nursing, obviously 69% here in their first year, which is the hardest year of a nurse, have a first end of life experience. Looking at that comfort scale that we used with those 12 questions of the end of life professional caregiver survey, um, when we totaled up the scores and did a mean, the General population nurses scored a 31.1, while the SEC students, um, who are now graduated and nurses out on their own, scored a 35.3. Also, the general population said that they had 7.1 hours of end-of-life education on average, while the SEC students said they had 12.2, showing that the SEC students were more comfortable and had re commonly reported more hours perceived education for end of life compared to the general population nurses surveyed. The SEC graduates had four questions that they scored higher than the general population on. And then the majority of the rest of them, they were either equal to or maybe just a little bit less depending on the question. One that they scored higher on was I'm comfortable um, helping families to accept a poor prognosis. I'm comfortable starting uh, and participating in a discussion about code status. Uh, I can assist members uh, and others through the grieving process. And then I know how to use non-drug therapies in management of patient symptoms. All showed that the SEC students were more comfortable uh, in those types of areas. One area where they were less comfortable, I believe, was um, patient planning. Well, practical nursing, that's not really in their scope or their scope is kind of varied there depending on the verbiage. So that may have swayed some of that um, type of scoring. But otherwise, they were pretty comparable to all the other questions that were asked. So this slide shows um, do numbers of hours of education really matter? And it is statistically significant that those with five hours or less scored less than those with six hours or more of end of life education. And you can see very clearly here that five hours or less, they can score lower other than these few outliers, which when I looked at these, I think they had over 10 plus years of CNA experience. So one, you're talking about older people, but you're also talking about 
people who have been CNAs for a very prolonged period of time. However, when I looked at the data, those that had been CNAs longer or been CNAs did not come out as statistically significant for increasing comfort. So I'm not exactly sure why I have these couple outliers, but my guess would be these were like 10 plus years of CNA experience. Your six hours or more showed a much steadier climb and showed a higher score on their comfort surveys. The other thing that was statistically significant in this area was that increased end of life experience also scored higher in the um, comfort survey. So I think that one was kind of a well duh. If you have more experience, you're going to be more comfortable with it. But the one thing that for educators, especially five hours or less, you're making uncomfortable uh, nurses in coping with end of life. If we can get them six hours or more, we're making them more comfortable with end of life. Still looking at six hours or more, five hours or less, uh, just kind of like um, the last four questions we looked at with the SCC versus uh, general population. I looked at it for the six hours or less, five hours or more, uh, or five hours or less, six hours or more. Um, and you can see really easily that your six hours or more of education scored higher on all of these. One interesting area that everyone's consistently scored low on was conflict resolution. So it's really interesting that um, those with con um, end of life that's going to have conflict in it is going to have a harder time. And that was across the board, no matter how many, no matter how many hours uh, of education we gave these patients or these students, um, they still conflict resolution was still kind of a low scoring number. One thing I really wanted to look at as an educator that teaches end of life is I wanted to look at what students are remembering. So this is where I go back to comparing the um, SCC nurse graduates with the general population nurses. If I looked at um, through the qualitative questions asking them what they remember, um, the SCC nurse graduates, 9% literally said nothing or very little. I mean, that is exactly verbatim what they said. Um, while the nothing to very little for the general population was 32%, meaning 91% of students that graduated from SCC, they remembered at least one concept, if not more, of, from their end of life education. But the general population nurses, only 68% remembered at least one concept or more. So what do you remember from end of life education? So we've already established some people remember more, more or less concepts. The biggest concept that people were remembering was what I call patient management. And this is the hands-on didactic piece. This is that hospice, palliative care, comfort cares. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the pharmaceuticals, the non-pharmaceuticals, the symptoms, the pathophysiology of the dying process, and then the post-mortem care. So those are really the pretty easy things to teach because they're, they're what they are. Now, then we start getting into support and communication, and that's where we're talking about um, that's when we start talking about education, grief, and therapeutic communication with listening and giving um, support and um, comfort. Advocate for the individual. Uh, people talked a lot about patient choice or individual journey, um, making sure that we, we do what they want and not necessarily what we want. Nurse personal growth, I think gets really interesting, hard to teach, but really interesting and really important as it's really hard to take care of someone when you don't understand or haven't learned to empathize with that end of life and um, knowing your own mortality. Things that people talked about were personal choice, personal experience. Again, do you have a nurse that doesn't have any end of life experience or do you have a nurse with a ton of end of life experience? And then colleague support, because that's really um, from the research I've seen is how people cope with end of life is they really reach out to their coworkers. Beauty of humanity 
is that dignity, compassion, and peaceful. So anytime someone talked about the, I, I remembered the dignity. I remember talking about compassion. I remember talking about those kinds of things. Those are all things that are the, the part that, of, that make us human, that make the, just the beauty of humanity. So I kind of combined all those into that uh, broader concept. When I look at first end of life experiences, I read through them trying to get kind of a, some basic themes. Was it positive, negative, or factual neutral? So meaning that I didn't get a direction either way of what the, how the nurse was feeling with it. Um, when I looked at the SEC nurse graduates, 41% had a positive experience with their first end of life experience, while 37% had a negative experience. And then 22 had a neutral or factual, you know, they, we coded the patient, we did this, we did that, this is what it was. Um, just very factual, very laid out. Um, when I look at the general population, and this just makes me so incredibly sad, 23% had a positive experience well, 50% had a negative experience for their first end of life experience. That means 50% of those nurses are walking around with that vivid memory and it's the negative memory. And that just makes me so sad for them. When I look at the statistical data, um, looking at positive, negative, or factual, there is a positive correlation um, with having uh, a positive end of life experience if they are given six hours or more of education. So again, getting that six hours or more of education is so important because that is showing that it ha helps these students who now become nurses help get through that end of life experience, which can be a very traumatic experience. And hopefully we can get this 50% to be less and be more closer to the 37 or even less because not all end of life experiences need to be negative and be carried on those nurses shoulders for the rest of their lives knowing that that was their first end of life experience. So I wanted to figure out uh, what was making an experience positive or negative. And I kind of broke it down into these kind of categories. I really had four major themes, which was patient management, family dynamics, expected, or and staff support. So it's kind of the top four that you see. In positive experience, the patient was managed well. The family was supportive. There's good staff support for the nurses. And then it was either an expected death or they did everything they could and felt that um, it was ending suffering by letting it happen. And then that beauty of a good death. So if it was a good death, it had all those kind of pieces to it. However, you have negative ones and the negative ones were um, unmanaged. So couldn't get our pain under control, couldn't manage um, oxygenation, that kind of stuff. Um, the family not prepared. So those are in those um, when they're not prepared or if there was family dynamics where they were arguing and family wasn't um, unified and together. Little or lack of staff support. So when people are saying they're alone, they're working night shift and they were alone and didn't have anyone to support them, that made a more negative experience. If they were unexpected or failed to save. And again, where we're teaching a lot of our students um, end of life is in the ICU. And we're teaching them in that medical model where death is a failure. And that's setting them up to still be ingrained that death is a failure so that when someone dies, they've failed to save. The other things that I thought were really huge um, that weren't related to those top four were the unprepared skills so that the nurses didn't think they had the skill set to do it and they were unprepared emotionally. I saw a lot of, I had never seen someone die before. I never had someone die in front of me before. I was unprepared for the emotional toll it would take or I didn't know what I needed to do for the skills. I was unqualified, underqualified. I saw a lot of that kind of information and, and feelings and that just breaks your heart knowing that those nurses had those experiences and there's nothing we can do about them at this point except for hopefully get people to get more education so that they don't have to have these experiences and their end of life experiences can lean more towards the positive. 
On this last slide, let's talk about how what we can do about this So, um, and what this research adds to or helps with. It first of all lets us know that nurses are experiencing end of life early in their career. Remember, 69% in their first year of nursing are having their um, first end of life experience, which to me, that first year, you're learning how to be a nurse, let alone how to deal with end of life. Nurses need more support. And remember, the research shows that that is a vivid memory. So if they're having that end of life experience in that first year, that memory is sticking with them. The other thing that we can talk about is the fact that um, education, end of life education needs to be consistently in programs. Um, no nursing program would get uh, accredited with zero maternal child hours or zero mental health or zero um, gerontology hours. But somehow we don't regulate the need for end of life education. And there's a big push for it right now, but we're not doing it. Um, six hours or more has shown to have benefits for students. Now, I'm not saying that there are programs that literally have zero hours of end of life education. To me, this is what the patient and what the students are perceiving of their education. So we need to find a way to make that education stick in their head, especially if we're only going to give them six hours or around that time, that amount. We've got to find a way to make it stick. Um, the type of education doesn't really seem to matter or didn't seem to matter in my research. However, a passionate teacher makes that education memorable and makes it stick a little bit better. Um, if they are not prepared, the impact of that memory can be very lasting. And so we really need to pay attention to that. The last thing that I want to just say in this is that this is a very passionate topic for nurses. And if we want it to go somewhere, we need to really start pushing to have people um, doing more research and looking into the lasting impacts of poor end of life, both on the patients, on the families, and on the staff that are doing it so that we can get more support for end of life education. Thank you guys so much for all your amazing support. If you participate in the survey or if you're watching this, um, I really appreciate it. If you want to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me through Facebook or however you got to watch this video. Let me know. Um, I would have no problem talking to you or coming out and talking to your schools or classes if that is a possibility um, or finding ways that we can make education memorable because I believe my SCC students showed their education is memorable and it has helped them to have positive end of life experiences. Thank you and thank you for all the wonderful care that you give to your patients. Have a great day.